Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Darren Duarte, and I am the uh, Director of Communications for the Brockton Police. And I just want to say today's news conference is a salute and also a thank you to our first responders. Uh, Brockton Police Chief John Crowley, Fire Chief Mike Williams are here, is here, also Plymouth County DA Cruz, along with Brockton Mayor Bill Carpenter, and Mayor Carpenter will kick things off for us. Mayor? Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here to the Champion Plan. It's uh, very exciting for us to have uh, the governor and um, the governor, along with Secretary Sutters and Commissioner Burrell, uh, all here with us today. And I know that uh, the governor has some great news to announce. I, I want to make sure while I have the opportunity, Governor, that uh, we thank you. Um, our approach to this opiate crisis from day one has been to attack this from both the supply and demand side. And today we'll spend a lot of time talking about saving lives and compassionate help and support for people that are struggling with addiction. But we are still equally committed to getting drug dealers off the streets of our city. And uh, with, with the leadership of the uh, Plymouth County District Attorney and his state troopers and Chief Crowley, uh, and additional state police resources. Uh, we had a very successful uh, sweep this morning, took more than a dozen street level dealers and a couple of bigger ones off the streets today. So I want to thank you for that help from the state police and the, and the district attorney that make it possible. So in talking about naloxone, uh, back in 2014, one of the first things we did in our administration was ask, all first responders to carry naloxone. So since early in 2014, every first responder in the city of Brockton has been equipped with naloxone. To get an idea of the impact, just last year, just in 2017, um, our first responders responded to 759 confirmed overdoses where there was a victim present when they arrived. And out of those 759 responses, 447 times they administered life-saving naloxone. 447 naloxone saves by first responders in just one year. And so the support from the state in helping us to be able to afford to continue to bring that type of first response and, and save lives. And one thing we've seen here with the Champion Plan is that many of those folks that in the last four years whose lives have been saved with naloxone have made it here to treatment and many of them are living in recovery today. So uh, we never give up and we don't view multiple tri trips through the Champion Plan to be a problem. We think it's just getting us closer to success and uh, we have a lot of folks that, that can explain that. The Champion Plan, our version of police assisted recovery here uh, just a little over two years in business now, and uh, we are well over 900 placements into treatment, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of close to 600 unique individuals, and that's from starting with just a couple volunteers upstairs to today having this space and a paid director and paid staff. So, um, you know, saving those lives provides an opportunity for treatment and it provides an opportunity for recovery. And the recovery coaches have been a very integral part, and the governor had a chance to hear firsthand uh, the impact that the recovery coaches' roles here in the champion plan have in not just getting people into treatment, but continuing to stay in touch with them over an extended length of time to help them stay on track and motivate them to remain uh, in recovery. And I know that, uh, Governor, you have the, the CARE Act pending in front of the legislature right now. It has a lot of very important provisions in it. Uh, but one of them is for a, a formal credentialing of recovery coaches, which I think is a really, really important step for us to continue to make uh, progress going forward. So um, my, my one final comment for you, Governor, the impact of naloxone, not just in saving lives, but when you think about the first responders in this room uh, that are out there saving lives with naloxone every day, um, and the work that's being done in the Champion Plan police assisted recovery where you know nearly a thousand folks have walked into the police station the last two years asking for help and, and not being afraid to walk in there and I think one of the biggest gains it's made the combination of those two is changing perceptions I think what the perception of police officers were about people struggling with addiction five years ago 
and what it is today has changed dramatically. Um, I don't think you can give someone Narcan and save their life mm -hmm. and not care about what happens to them the next day. And, but it's also changed the perceptions of people that are struggling with addiction towards police. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, let's face it, most folks struggling with addiction have probably had some negative interaction with the police department. Uh, yet, today, we've got people struggling with addiction who are not afraid to walk into the police station knowing that they'll be offered help instead of a, a arrest. And to the point that with the champion plan, we've even made up these business size cards that give people information how to come in and get help in the champion plan. And we have police officers on the street today that keep these in their pockets so that when they're interacting with people that they know are struggling, uh, instead of slapping handcuffs on them, they're, they're giving them the card and telling them to come on into the police station and let us get you some help. So I think uh, all of that does show progress as discourages we may get from time to time when we have a bad day or we have a tragedy, I still think we've made a lot of progress. Uh, and Governor, you deserve a lot of the credit for that, your compassionate leadership on this issue, the way you've been willing to tackle it in a nonpartisan basis and acknowledge it as the uh, public health safety crisis that it is, uh, is truly appreciated here in the city of Brockton. So uh, I would like to uh, take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, the Governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me just start, first of all, by thanking you for serving on our task force uh, and representing the voice of so many community leaders around the Commonwealth as part of the really important work that you did with that group to put together our prevention, education, treatment, and recovery strategy, which eventually led to our groundbreaking legislation and the program we've been implementing for the last four years, many elements of which have been adopted by and implemented by leaders in other states and in other communities. Um, we also were the home of the first police-assisted recovery program, which was up in Gloucester. And at this point in time, there are police-assisted uh, recovery programs going on in more than 30 states. Uh, they meet on a fairly regular basis at various places around the country. Every once in a while they all get together to talk about best practices and what's working and what's not. And it's pretty clear that first responders have become, in many cases, um, not just lifesavers in the particular moment associated with the administration of naloxone, but have in many cases become the front door and the pathway for people to treatment, um, which is an extraordinary change from the way people thought about and dealt with this issue as recently as five years ago. And I do want to thank your colleagues from Taunton and your colleagues from Fall River and New Bedford who are here with us today, uh, who have been working this issue hard in their communities as well. Um, this is a team effort. It's an all-hands-on-deck issue. And as I said on the day we signed that original legislation three years ago, that we didn't get into this terrible place overnight. It took over a decade to get to the point where we were dealing with the kind of pu raging public health crisis that this issue had become, and we weren't going to get out of it overnight either, uh, despite the best efforts of so many. But I will say that for the first time in over a decade, Massachusetts saw a drop in overdose deaths, a drop in prescriptions, opioid prescriptions, and a leveling out of overdoses generally. Uh, we were one of the very few states that could make that claim. And that, while it represents positive progress and certainly a move in a different direction than the one we had seen for literally years and years before that, we still have a very long way to go uh, to deal with this addiction crisis and this opioid epidemic. And it's important that we continue to invest aggressively in programs and services that can help us uh, stem the tide. And so we're here today for two reasons. The first is, to once again urge the legislature to act on the CARE Act, which is the legislation we put before them last fall that does a number of things to build on the success of our original uh, opioid legislation, but among other things, as the mayor pointed out, creates a bona fide certified credentialing program for recovery coaches here in Massachusetts. We've done some demonstration work and some piloting work with recovery coaches on our own, it's turned out to be an incredibly powerful way to both help people get into treatment and once they get into treatment to stay into treatment. 
and we would like to see it become sort of a fundamental building block of what we do with respect to dealing with treatment and recovery. There are many other elements to the bill, but the other one I would simply point out um, is it, it creates the possibility of establishing a blister pack for, um, for writing prescriptions in the first place. I'm one of these people who thinks that part of the reason we ended up in such a terrible place to begin with was because people were over-prescribing this medication and under-representing or, or under-appreciating the addictive consequences of giving somebody 20 or 30 days worth of supply on this stuff. But I think part of the reason they did that was because there was no vehicle to give somebody the two or three pills that maybe they needed and no more um, during the original incident. And that's because we don't have a vehicle to do that. This legislation would make it possible for us to put together a group to establish a blister pack, which I think would, for many, many, many short-term pain situations, would be a far preferable way of dealing with this than somebody giving somebody a 15 or 20 day supply. There's still too, way, way too much of that going on in the healthcare community generally, despite the progress that we've made. And that has to be part of how we think about this issue going forward. But in addition to that, we need to continue to do everything we can on the ground to ensure that people, um, when they do overdose, those who are there first, which more often than not are members of our first responder community, have access to the tools and the equipment uh, that they need to make sure they can save a life. You can't get somebody into treatment if you can't save their life. And, um, and that's what today's announcement's about. And I'm going to defer to Health and Human Service Secretary Mary Lou Sutters, who led the work of the task force, oversaw the development of our first piece of legislation, and has been, for all intents and purposes, the eyes and the ears and the heart of our approach to dealing with the opioid epidemic in Massachusetts to talk about that particular announcement. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Mary Lou. Governor, thank you. He usually steals all my lines. Um, um, so we are, actually we're thrilled to be always back in Brockton. Um, the mayor has been an extraordinary champion in this journey. I'm just going to Yeah, do right something. There. Okay. Thank you. Um, and also pleased to see our counter, our friends from Taunton, Fall River, and New Bedford also here today. So I'm here to formally announce uh, the release of $940,000 in funding to cities and towns in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts hardest hit by the opioid epidemic um, for um, the purchase of naloxone as well as to spread the word about the Good Sam law and any other training available that the cities and towns think is important in the fight of the opioid epidemic. Um, as you know, the, the funds available to each of the cities and towns uh, is also a way for you to purchase Narcan naloxone at uh, much cheaper than what the retail price is. So the cost is about forty dollars for the the two the two pack there for naloxone. So we it's it is uh, again it's like up to fifty thousand dollars for depending on the size of the town. We're spreading it out based upon the size of the municipality. We're going to make it's a it's immediately available to you as you know. Uh, only one of the fire chiefs actually put his hat out for me to put the money in. <laughs> Sorry, I did not bring the checks. Um, but this is part of ours. The governor said and the mayor said, um, if we can't save lives, we cannot help people find the pathway to treatment and to have good lives. And so this is part of our commitment to the communities around really getting the locks on out to communities. Um, for you to be able to purchase it as inexpensively as possible. That's one. Secondly, as, as you know, this administration has taken a public health approach to the opioid epidemic. We believe very much in a prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery strategy. The Governor's CARE Act bill builds upon that foundational um, basis of prevention, intervention, treatment, and recovery. Um, the credentialing of recovery coaches, and I'm talking quickly because I'm standing before between you and hearing from a recovery coach um, is so important to help individuals find a pathway to treatment is from someone who has experienced their own challenges and can help them. Um, they understand with a, a sense of empathy that unless you walk the walk, it's hard to talk the talk. Um, that's one. Secondly, the, another piece in the Governor's Care Act that some people uh, don't think about is in fact one of the things in it would give the Commonwealth, would give to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and the Commissioners of the Departments of Public Health and Mental Health the, the right to um, really require any providers in the Commonwealth to take all insurance, including MassHealth. 
So any individual, any providers who want to do business in our great commonwealth, they would have to actually meet the commonwealth's needs and ensure that they take Medicaid, which we know has a disproportionate number of individuals who suffer with addictions. So we are in this um, for the long haul uh, because it is, as the governor says, it's a public health crisis that was long in making and will be long in us to find our way out of. But one of the things that's important to remember, and I said this last night up in Gloucester with the Pari community, is addictions is, is the treatment of relapse. When someone relapses, it is not a failure, but that opportunity for us to lean in and touch that person and help them find that pathway back to treatment. And seeking treatment and asking for treatment is a sign of strength and not weakness. So with that, let me turn it back to the mayor of Brockton for the next interview. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, as a couple of us have mentioned, um, we really do believe in this, uh, the value of the growing role of recovery coaches uh, folks with life experience who have also received training. And uh, one of the many provisions of the CARE Act that will make a difference is this credentialing and formalizing uh, of recovery coaches. Uh, we thought it would be uh, really important for us to introduce one of our recovery coaches here at the Champion Plan to you. Andrew uh, is a young man who grew up here in the city. Uh, he's a father and uh, he's one of the champion plan recovery coaches here and I, I think he I think his story is compelling and I asked him to share it with you good afternoon my name is Andrew Ledoux and I'm a recovery coach here at the champion plan in Brockton um, two years ago at this time I was homeless on the street um, completely desperate broken Sorry, just trying to get no, a little good. closer for you. <clears throat> you're taller than he is. <laughs> <laughs> Not as tall as you, though. <laughs> yeah. So t two years ago at this time, I was homeless on the streets of Brockton. Um, I really had no sense of direction, zero hope. I had absolutely nothing. Um, and honestly, I did not want to get help at that time, but for some reason, my father gave me a call. At that time, I wasn't in touch with my father whatsoever, um, but he gave me a phone call because he heard about the program called the Champion Plan. And I went to the police station, I believe it was um, July or August of 2016. And um, I went to the police station, and within 10 minutes, somebody was there to pick me up and take me back to our center here. And um, I was placed into a detox. Within 48 hours of being placed into that detox, I left. Um, but I went back to the champion plan because I remember how they treated me with you know, uh, support, respect. They actually genuinely cared about me and my well-being. So I went back, and I went back multiple times. And eventually I made it on to a CSS, I made it on to a TSS, and I made it on to a halfway house uh, located in Norton, Mass. And that's really where you know my journey began. It started, and you know the champion plan was there the entire way from 72 hours in detox. Mary Lou began doing my follow-ups and seeing how I was, and asking how she could support me um, to move forward in recovery. And um, I don't know that halfway house I was at was actually it, it was great. It definitely served its purpose, and from there I began doing a lot of events here with you know the staff at the Champion Plan uh, the night of her recovery last year um, there was a few different events that I went to and somewhere down that line in those follow-ups like I said uh, at the Champion Plan we begin follow-ups at 72 hours and follow them up all the way to two years and in between those follow-ups um, the relationship grew and it just continued to grow um, they offered me to go to the Recovery Coach Academy in Quincy Mass um, at a New Way Recovery Center, and that was July of 2017. And in February of this year, they offered me a position here at the Champion Plan. Um, and I love it, I should, I'm forever grateful for it. But today, my life looks completely different. Um, there's two reasons why I'm passionate about this work. One, obviously, because I'm living in long-term recovery. Two, because I lost my brother from a heroin overdose um, on September 18th of 2010 at the age of 22 years old. But like I said, today my life looks completely different than what it was two years ago. Um, I'm a father. I live in a beautiful home. I live in a beautiful town um, with my girlfriend, my one-year-old son, Luca. Uh, we're expecting our second child together August 2nd of this year. And um, thank you. 
Um, my oldest son, Bentley, he'll be five in September, and I'm able to be a full-time father to him as well. I see him on the weekends. And that's completely different from what my life looked like, and that's all because, you know, the champion plan and the support that they gave me and the resources that they offered to me. Um, also, I, I was a high school dropout. I got my GED while I was incarcerated in 2014. Well, since then, I, uh, I got hooked up with Mass Rehab. I went back to school, and I've been able to make the dean's list the last three semesters at Massasoit Community College. Um, it's, it's unbelievable what, how much help is really out there. It's just a matter of navigating it and finding what resources best fit for that individual. Um, but yeah, so this morning I was able to send in my application to become a certified addictions recovery coach. Um, so as well as, you know, the recovery coach academy that I attended, I also uh, completed 500 hours of internship hours. Thank you. And like I, like I was just saying, that's really when um, you learn you're on the front lines because we never know the situation that's going to come our way. Um, just being able to handle it, knowing what's out there for resources and what's out there for help. Um, like my passion here to work with individuals who suffer with substance use disorder. I believe that, I, I can confidently say that's why I was you know, put on this earth. It's my purpose, it's my passion. Um, I've never been passionate about anything in my entire life, but I can confidently say that that's one thing I am passionate about. Um, and like when it comes to with my brother passing away, like now after doing a lot of serious work on myself, this, to this day the only sense I can make of that is maybe he had to die so I could live my life. Um, and I know he's you know looking down, he's happy, he's proud because of the way my life turned away. Um, <clears throat> but, and today I didn't come here to show off my accomplishments whatsoever. I came here to talk about that anybody can do the same thing I did. It's just a matter of finding the resources. When a participant comes to the champion plan and asks me, um, how did I do it? What did I do? And my answer is simple. The only difference between me and that individual is I utilize all the resources that this state has to offer. That's it. And um, over time, I accumulated a lot of things. And that's really it. Like, there's a lot of work to do. Um, but the resources are there, 100%. Um, but I want to thank the Champion Plan, everybody here for letting me share my story, all my co-workers, and um, Mayor Bill Carpenter. Thank you, guys. So thank you, Andrew. So, well Governor, I think that we're going to uh, give you a chance for some closing remarks and the opportunity to take a few questions. Well, these guys pretty much said it all. I don't have much to add. I would just ask if you have any on-topic top, questions. If you want to do off-topic stuff, we'll do it somewhere else. Why do you want to announce this, uh, these naloxone grants in Brockton of all places today? Um, I think part of it had to do with the fact that we had a terrific relationship with the mayor. He had done a wonderful job serving on our task force. Uh, his voice has been an important one for us from the beginning when we first got into this conversation. And these operations that have been put in place by a number of our um, a number of our communities that involve first responder driven pathways to treatment, typically coming on the heels in many cases of the re, of the life saving opportunities associated with naloxone, made it just seem to us like an appropriate uh, place to make an announcement like this. We're enormously proud of the work that a lot of our mayors and a lot of our first responders have done, not just in saving people's lives on the street every single day but also being a primary path to treatment for many of them. Um, and as I said in my remarks, boy, is that different than the way things worked as recently as maybe five years ago. And it's a huge step forward for everybody. And the mere fact that you now have over 30 states that have um, similar kinds of operations going on speaks volumes about the fact that this is a program model that a lot of people believe works, including me. Other questions? OK. <laughs> Joined a, filed a, uh, they announced they're going to be filing a lawsuit against uh, the uh, distributors and the manufacturers in the opioid industry. Uh, what do you think about these lawsuits? Cities and communities around the country have been filing them against. So, um, I actually stood with the Attorney General when she announced her lawsuit against Purdue Pharma, which was for the loss of life of 651 residents of the Commonwealth who died of opioid overdoses since the original lawsuit was settled in 2007. Um, 
that lawsuit that the AG filed involved a lot of legwork and a lot of work uh, on the research side from our folks at the Department of Public Health to literally piece together the chain that went from uh, Purdue Pharma and prescription writing all the way through to people who actually died of an opioid overdose. So instead of being what I would describe as sort of a just general disruption lawsuit, this one's literally on behalf of 651 people who lived here in the Commonwealth who died of opioid overdoses. I stood with the AG for several reasons. The first was because our folks worked so hard with her office to identify these people and to run the chain back all the way to Purdue to begin with. But I also stood there because Purdue settled in 2007 a major national lawsuit around the addictive issues associated with opioid pain medication in general and OxyContin in particular. And it was acknowledged at that point in time that this stuff was a terribly addictive uh, painkiller. Certainly in certain limited instances could make a big difference with respect to helping people deal with pain. But there was simply no doubt by that point in time that it was horribly addictive. And did they actually live up to the commitments that they made as part of that lawsuit and change the way they marketed the medication and the case they made with respect to the addictive properties associated with it? I would argue the answer to that was no. In fact, I think they went in just the opposite direction. Here we are 11 years later. 11 years later, and they're still one of the major distributors of OxyContin and other forms of prescription pain medication. It took them forever to get around to building a tamper-proof alternative to the original prescription. And from my point of view, these types of lawsuits are absolutely the right message for many of us to send to this particular uh, community on the pharma side. Um, their unwillingness, inability, whatever it might be, willful blindness to come forward and make the case for why this particular medication, while useful in dealing with particular kinds of pain, comes with very significant addictive consequences is a disgrace, and I'll leave it at that. Cheers to the mayor for being part of the gang that got into this. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, folks. Thank you.